If you would like a free newsletter on this or other subjects, just give us a call at Christian Answers. The phone number is area code 512-218-8022. That's 512-218-8022. Or you could email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's cdebater at aol.com. Thank you. to our program. This is Christian Answers and I'm the director of Christian Answers, Larry Wessels. I want to thank you for being with us today as we delve into another topic. Uh, we've been doing this program for years and years on cable access television and we, uh, those of you who are familiar with our program know that we cover different topics, subjects, dealing from a theological and biblical point of view. Uh, our topic today is on the subject of Islam, the world Muslim religion. We're going to get into it in quite some detail. This is show number two in our series on Islam. And join me in this very informative, detailed, and I think very important subject today on basically the question that we're going to ask in this series is, can the Muslim religion send someone to hell? That's the topic of this series. That's the, the question we ask and the title of this series. But joining me for answering this very important question and in this series is Steve Morrison. Steve, great to always have you Thank here, you. brother. Steve is Director of Research for Christian Answers and has done extensive studies into the religion of Islam. In fact, uh, behind him is some of the research he's done, and we've covered this in a previous show, on uh, how he studied the Quran, cover to cover, uh, the Al-Bakari Hadith, other Muslim literature and material. Uh, but for those of you who did not join us in the first show, this is show number two, as I said, uh, we're going to briefly recap what the first show was about, very briefly, and then move into today's subject. Uh, and Steve, just make some comments here for our, our listening audience as we bring up the charts that we used in the first show. Okay. And, uh, and just briefly recap what, what our viewers missed from show number one. Okay, as we're, we're looking at the, the charts, the, the first chart, chart you'll see on your screen, we see that Allah is a generic word. Anything you want to say about that, Steve? Well, uh, people have debated whether Allah was really a generic word for God, meaning the common God, you know, just any word, or was it a specific pre-Islamic idol? And uh, we showed evidence that actually the answer is both. And, and, and it, is, it is a generic word for God. It, it was derived from the, the common Middle Eastern word El for God, at least the, you know, that, that's what we think. But it was also a specific idol of the Koresh. This specific Allah of the Koresh tribe had three daughters, Lot, Uzzah, and Manat. And uh, there was a verse in the Quran at one time in Surah 5319 that said their intercession was to be hoped for, and later that, that was taken out. Uh, and there are other verses that talks about uh, abrogation of verses in Surahs 1339, 16101, and 2106. So some verses that were in the Quran a period of time were taken out for various reasons. So, but anyway, uh, this shows that if th there was a specific Allah in Muhammad's time who had daughters, and Muhammad never said, stop worshiping this one Allah and worship another Allah. He basically told the Quraysh, you worship Allah correctly. Um, so pretty much was sort of a partially a continuation of, of, the, of the previous Allah that the Quraysh had. Uh, and the, the next chart shows uh, Muhammad's wives and concubines. The Quran says that everyone, every man could have a maximum of four wives, but the Quran also has a special exception uh, for Muhammad. And uh, some of these wives 
uh, uh, Muslims will tell you were, were, were done for uh, because a general might have died and, and he would marry a, or, or a Muslim leader might have died and he married the widow so he could take care of her but uh, some of these wives definitely were not that way like Sophia who was uh, from Kabar when all the 700 or so men were killed then uh, Sophia was married to Muhammad some were slaves and concubines and some there was sort of an uncertain relationship we're not sure if they were regular wives if they were concubines or if they maybe weren't married to Muhammad Muhammad at all. So, um, you know, it, it, we don't really know, you know, it, why, you know, Muhammad had to have this exception in the Quran just for, just for him. Um, another, uh, Zainab the third was interesting and in that Muhammad's adopted son was ordered by Allah through Muhammad to divorce his wife in order that Muhammad could marry her. Okay, so apparently Muhammad didn't have enough wives, uh, you know, before he married all these because Muhammad had to Allah had to have another man divorce his wife so Allah could marry her. Okay, and then just moving on quickly, last time we discussed uh, Muhammad the Prosperous. Uh, you know, Muhammad was not always a poor man. The Bukhari Hadith, three, four, nine, uh, volume 3, 495, says, When Allah made the Prophet wealthy through conquests. So uh, he was wealthy and he probably needed that since he didn't, you know, work, you know, as a farmer or anything like that. He was a teacher and he had to take care of his wives and everything. It also says that Muhammad was not sinless, which went in great detail uh, in the uh, previous video about uh, he was a sinner like any, everybody else. And even the Bukhari Hadith it said that Jesus w was the only one who was not touched by sin when he was born. And uh, even Muhammad was. Okay, uh, Muhammad, it's kind of interesting, was bewitched at one time. So uh, an evil person cast magic upon Muhammad, um, the Bukhari Hadiths record, and so they could, so you could have a demonic cat, you know, spell on Muhammad, the prophet of God. And this is according to Bukhari, volume four, number 490, and also volume four, number 400, and volume eight, no, number 400. So if we look at the origins of Islam, it's sort of a mixture of uh, Pre-Islamic uh, 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 Arabian practices, uh, uh, some uh, Christian things thrown in, some Judaism thrown in, some things from apocryphal gospel thrown in, but but uh, looking at it, it seems sort of like a, a mixture of a lot of different things. Okay, now with that said, Steve, we're gonna we're gonna take a look now in this particular episode, episode two in this series, on is the Quran from God. Now, the, the viewers at home can see this chart we have up here, and you'll see the things we will cover in this particular episode. How the Quran, Quran was written, in, internal contradictions, the setting sun, Muhammad and the Irish Americans, moral character, and differences in basic tone and message. Now, let's take a look at this surah from the Quran. It says, Surah 482, do they not ponder on the Quran? Had it been from other than Allah, they would surely have found therein much discrepancy." End quote. Now, uh, what do you have to say about that, Steve? Well, th this is sort of, uh, you know, saying that if it hadn't been from Allah, they would have found many contradictions or errors. And actually, the truth of the matter is, uh, many contradictions and errors have been found in the Quran. That, and, and, and we will show you some of them today. We'll also give you uh, Muslim responses to that and then also responses to those responses. I got you. Now, here's another verse, but this one's from the Bible, Proverbs 30, verses 5 and 6. It says, Every word of God is flawless. He is a shield to those who take refuge in Him. Do not add to His words, or He will rebuke you and prove you a liar. Okay. I think that's pretty self evident and uh, very clear what's being said here by the Word of God. If something's from God, it's going to be true, it's going to be faultless, it's going to be flawless, it's going to be something you can uh, put your teeth into and mm -hmm. believe. It's not going to be full of errors and contradictions and, 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 and things we know aren't true. Mm -hmm. So if it's from God, it has to be that way. Okay, how can you tell if a book is from God? And we have the chart here. And what you, uh, Steve, wants you go through that list there. Okay. And, and well, uh, one key issue is consistency with what it says are previous books from God. So somebody could look at the Quran and they could look at the at the New Testament and they could say, well, these books have a different message. Okay, the New Testament says to honor the Son just as you honor the Father. It says, you know, that Jesus, you know, the Word was with God and was God, and the Quran says that Jesus was no more than a messenger. 
Okay, well Muslims have a response for that. They say that the, that the New Testament that we have today was not the original message from Jesus. And we will analyze that later. But I'll just say it at this point in passing that if it was the same message as Jesus, that itself would prove the Quran wrong. Now, Muslims say it is not, but if it was, I think that Muslims would have to admit that, that, that the Quran would not be from God if the Bible has been reliably preserved. Okay, the other thing we can look at fulfilled prophecy. There's a lot of fulfilled prophecy in the Old Testament. Uh, and some in, in the new uh, about Christ and about other events and you really don't see um, prophecies in the in the Quran and you don't see prophecies in the Bible about Muhammad. Uh, some Muslims have tried to find some things and we will uh, discuss those but there's nothing that really stands unless you say that Muhammad was God which most Muslims don't or you say Muhammad glorified Jesus which most Muslims don't do that. Okay. Uh, and also, it, it needs to all be true from God. Uh, you, you know, if there's something that says, uh, you know, like worship one God, and then let's say, like in, in, you know, there's something that says worship something else or do something else in contradiction, then you say, well, that's not all from God. Okay. And uh, also, you kind of think, well, if God did want to send a book, book or books to us, then God would probably want to have the meaning of those books preserved. And so, you know, there are some scriptures written by other religions a long time ago that have been lost forever, and those haven't been preserved. And so you can say, well, you know, if those were from God, God saw no purpose to preserve those. So we want to look at what is preserved as maybe a candidate for being from God. Surely God who created all things has the power to preserve that word mm -hmm. and see to it that it gets to the people out there that he wants the message to get to. Uh, letting a message be wiped out almost immediately and then just, uh, no one gets the message down the line doesn't seem to fall in line with the God that we know and trust from the scripture. And even a Muslim going from the Quran wouldn't believe that Allah would just let his word just go to go away like that. Right, 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 right. Now I will say that Muslims, they do think that there may have been other previous local prophets who had a local temporary message for that time. But there wouldn't have been a universal message uh, coming out that uh, Allah's, you know, this would be Allah's word and it says, oh, then my word was lost and I got to give you a new word because uh, I was unable to preserve the previous word. So would Muslims uh, say on the universal word, let's say of the Quran, they would accept the Quran as being the word of Allah. Right. And that's a universal word. And so therefore Allah would be responsible to preserve that word and see to it that it gets out to people out there. Right. And so on the fifth point, you know, has the basic meaning of the Quran been preserved? You know, on, the, on, on that last point, um, actually the fourth point, on that last point, you know, uh, Islam passes and Christianity passes and Judaism passes and even Hinduism passes, you know. Because mm -hmm. they're saying it's being preserved. So this is a, this is a key uh, pointer to, to recognize in, in, in this study. Now, we're going we're gonna to take a look at the Quran now, and the Quran is put together by, uh, uh, or at least it's... Uh, it's supposed to be accumulated accumulation of the sayings of Muhammad, the mm -hmm. prophet, the Allah's apostle. Uh, but the key here is, and we have a chart now on the screen, how Muhammad got his messages that comprise what we now have as uh, supposedly this the uh, universal truth of God from Allah. There. Okay. So. Uh, Steve, take us on uh, through uh, this. Uh, all right, well, well, Muhammad just didn't stand up and say, I think it ought to be like this, or something like that. It was much more dramatic than that. Sometimes Muhammad would have a ringing in his ears, and his heart would be rapidly, and he would go into what would almost look like a, 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 a seizure, a fit. His face would turn red, he'd breathe very heavily, sometimes he'd fall on the ground. And he might even have a vision and see things other people did, did, didn't see. And then he would, he would come and he would have a message that would be um, said, and according to uh, uh, some Muslims that I've talked to, it, it and Muslims and maybe former Muslims, that it's not wasn't always sure. There was some kind of ambiguity on on, on, on what he said, and so people had to kind of fill in a little bit. Um, but he, he would ha he would have these things, and and if someone saw that in ancient times, they would know what to think. I mean, would he be demon possessed? Was this a message from God? Was it something else? They wouldn't know. Well, the viewers are looking at this chart. They're saying he's got ringing in his ears. His heart is beating rapidly. His face is turning red. He's breathing heavily. He's sweating profusely. Mm -hmm. He's doing all these things, and some some people 
gathered, well, this is a, he's being touched by an angel to give a message. Mm-hmm. Others thought he might be demon possessed. Others thought he was having some kind of illness, mm-hmm. uh, something of this nature. Uh, uh, apparently, the Muslims though believe that he was being touched by an angel or something like right. that, and being given a message from uh, Allah when he right. did all these things. And all these things are preserved in the Muslim writings, particularly the Hadith, right. the Al Bukhari Hadith. And and and, and, and uh, another explanation uh, is maybe neither angel or demon, but some people have looked at this and said, well, maybe Muhammad was having an epileptic fit. And and and, and of course, and, this and, is and, and, entirely denied by our modern day Muslim apologists friends who are out there who would deny that he had an ep- epileptic. Yeah, I, 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 because they're, uh, they're, they're holding to the truth that Allah can preserve his word if, since they believe the Quran is from God. You know, some Muslims might deny he had an epileptic fit, but a lot of Muslims perhaps have never even considered it. You know, they just have just assumed without really thinking about it that, well, instead of from God, it must be from God. Very good. Okay. Uh, with that said, let's get into this next chart, which says how the Quran was written down. Okay. Now, a lot of people assume, now people that don't can see the chart, but a lot of people assume that Muhammad wrote it himself. Mm-hmm. So, well, what do you say? It, it, either Muhammad was illiterate, could not read or write, or someone have said that maybe he couldn't write because there was uh, but a, a place to where he apparently recognized a name or something. But regardless, Muhammad did not write any of the Quran down on paper himself. It was written uh, by followers that, that, that when he had one of these surahs or, or, or one of these verses, a part of the surah, they would write it down on whatever was handy. Uh, you have parts of the Quran written on palm leaves, rocks, and bones. This is according to the Bakari Hadith, volume 6, 509. There was no organized uh, manuscript of the Quran prior to Muhammad's death. They had to, he had four people who had to collect the Quran after Muhammad died. Okay, and surprisingly, maybe for some Muslims, is that some verses of the Quran did not survive. Uh, there are people who they were the only ones who had memorized certain uh, verses, and when they were killed in battle, um, then those were lost forever. Uh, and that's according to Bukhari uh, 457 and 62 and 69 and 299, and also Bukhari uh, volume 6 of 509. And so perhaps uh, the fact that some people started losing some information was sort of a stimulus to say, uh, we need to collect, the, you know, collect all this together and make it one form so we don't lose anything more if someone else you know, dies for whatever reason. Okay, so we're getting from actual Islamic sources that Muhammad himself did not compile the Quran. Mm-hmm. It was simply uh, an assortment or a compilation that people were able to put together from all these things just you just listed. And it to me it sounds a little haphazard. I mean, you know, just mm-hmm. looking at something. If I, if uh, let's say you work, let's say we work for a company, and the, the big boss comes in and says, I, I want you to write me a uh, report on such and such the development of this particular product in this industry. Uh, now, let's say you don't know a whole lot about everything, uh, and, but you decide that, well, I think I'll do this report by going over here to the secretary for my friend over there and tell her a few things I know that I'll put in the report, and then I'll go over here to the, the water boy down, down mm-hmm. the street, and I'll tell him a few things I know that I'll be putting in the report. I, I, I've got different things, ideas in my mind about what I want to put in this report for the big boss, but I'm not going to write it down. I'm going to go, I'm going to tell that secretary over here, I'm going to go down there and talk to that guy. Now, now my wife at home, I'll go tell her a few things that I'm thinking about putting in the report. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and over time, I tell maybe 40 or 50 people different things, about what I'm gonna, but I never myself write the report. Right. And now, let's say I suddenly get killed in a car wreck and the boss still wants the report. Mm-hmm. So basically, he has to go back and say, well, did you hear him say anything about what he's going to put? That's what it sort of sounds like to me. The boss man has to go and check with all these people on what they can remember, or what they, and, and they kind of compile something after the fact. Uh, to me, that sounds kind of haphazard and shaky at best for a detailed, accurate report. Well, yes. Uh, the, now, many of his teachings were given to more than one person, and some people did try to memorize. It. Well, many people tried to memorize parts of it. So, it, it, but no it, one had the whole thing. 
I'm not sure that anybody, there was one, someone who claimed to have the whole thing, but then, you know, we, we, we don't really know. But, but we, we, I mean, they did take it seriously. So, so it was not made quite as haphazard as that. But we did rely on the memory of the different people. And in some cases, uh, the memory of people was a little bit different. And that there were different ways of reciting the Quran, and Muslims will like uh, dismiss those and say, "Oh, they're just dialect differences." But actually, we have some of those variations, and they're actually content differences too. And it's not, and it's on the consonants as well as just the vowels. Uh, and, and and they aren't major doctrinal changes, but but they do show that there are now, now since there's so many sources that are trying to do a good job of remembering it or whatever, mm -hmm. how do you get uh, somebody to compile into one record? Who's got the power? To get all these people together to put the, a book together like that right, at right, all, how, right. how do you accomplish well, that? Well, we're going to talk about that more in in the next video. But but very briefly, there were four people who compiled um, the Quran uh, after Muhammad's death, and 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 then later after that, the Caliph Uthman uh, standardized the Quran. And just to make sure to co try to cover his tracks, he ordered all of the copies of the Quran burned, including uh, one of the, one of the ones that was compiled. You know, some of the ones compiled before that. I guess before he did. Standard side, right? So and, we're, we're, the reason he had them burned then was because they perhaps did not say the same thing. His standard standardized version. Yeah, and, and 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 we're not just speculating on that. We know that because some of them did survive. Uh, and the Elazar, one's in the Elazar Museum in Cairo, and it actually does have some differences. And there's another a codex that we have in which Surahs one, and I believe it's one thirteen and one fourteen, are not present. Mm -hmm. Another one to where there was a, a short surah that was added that's not in the original. So Uzman was not able to burn every last book. Right. Okay. Well, we'll save that for the next show, but uh, let's go back into this then. Uh, our next chart that the viewers are looking at is internal contradictions. Okay. Now, uh, this is one that takes a little explanation. Okay. Was the first person to believe uh, in the message of the Quran and, or, or the message from Allah, was it really Moses in Surah 143 or was it Abraham in Surah 614? If we look at that, in Surah, 143, in Surah 7, 143, it's a long verse, but the very uh, last part of the verse, um, it, uh, after Moses fell down in a swoon, he recovered his senses. He said, Glory be to thee, to thee I turn in repentance, and I am the first to believe. Okay, so it says Moses was the first to believe, or was it Abraham that was first to believe? Now. It, on the other hand, if either one of them were the first to believe the message from Allah, then if the message of Allah, if it was lost just prior to Muhammad coming, like, modern, like Muslims, modern Muslims say, then Allah's main message was corrupted. And it's like, well, if it was corrupted and lost once, why, it, could have been, it could be lost again. Um, or if it wasn't, then why was Moses first to believe? Or if not, was Abraham the first to believe? So it's kind of an inconsistency there. Another one that's kind of interesting is it says, the world was created in six days. This is according to a, a number of sources, Surah 754, 10.3, uh, 11.7, and 2529. However, Surah 41, 9 through 12 describes creation and it uses eight days. It has two days of creating heaven and the earth and then f four days of putting stuff on the earth basically then two more days. Okay, Muslims uh, try to answer this by saying, well, the uh, second period of the four days is kind of included in the first period, and so that kind of becomes six. Okay, well, a couple problems with that is you can't put four days into two days. And if the second day, uh, which does not have any separation really with, uh, 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 within the, the second day, sh you know, shows things on the earth, if that's included, you can't put four into two. Also, if you, it, uh, verses 9 and 10, uh, um, this is in Surah 41, nine, verses 9 to verses 10, they show a separation between the first two days and the second four days. So, you know, it's either six days of creation or eight days of creation, and there's no resting, you know, mentioned like there is in the Bible. So they really have a problem there. So here are some internal contradictions in the Quran. Right. And the only way a Muslim apologist or someone that's really trying to defend the, the Quran on these particular passages you just pointed out the only way they're really going to be able to escape it is to come up with arguments that 
really, as you just explained, on eight days or six days and putting four days into two days, mm -hmm. it, it, it's almost uh, uh, verbal gymnastics. They have right. to, they're, they're jumping through hoops they can't get through. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yet they're stumbling through these hoops and falling all over the ground, but they're expecting you still to believe it. Right. Yet when they attack other religions, they try to use arguments of logic and, 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 and you know, specific examples that would make sense to the, the normal person. Mm -hmm. But here, they turn around and, and do what they accuse others of doing when they try to explain away problem passages. Right. It, 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 I think that if you gave uh, these surahs to somebody who was not a Muslim, not a Christian, and didn't know what they were, and said how many days of creation, they would say six for one set of surahs, and they'd say eight for, for the other surah. I, I mean, it's, it's pretty straightforward, actually. Right, right. Okay, now with that, uh, we're, we're talking about uh, internal contradictions, which also leads to external problems. Okay. Uh, and here's our next chart. So. All right, well, it, well uh, one, which is kind of interesting, a little history behind it, is surah 18, 85 to 86. It mentions a ruler called Zul Karnaim. And he followed the setting sun, and he found that it went down into the waters of a muddy spring. Okay. Now, if it, if you read some Muslim commentators, they will tell you Zul Kar Karnaim, uh, which is uh, was another name for Alexander the Great. Okay. Mm -hmm. Other Muslims will disagree and say, no, it probably wasn't him. It was probably it was some great ruler. It might have been Cyrus, uh, the the Persian king. Others say, no, it might have been this king in uh, what's now modern uh, uh, Yemen, and that's not that's obscure in the entire point though whoever this ruler named Zulkarnaim was he found out that the sun went to the waters of a muddy spring which we know scientifically doesn't happen and it, it, the context of it he's talking about he sees the people in the rising sun who are kind of primitive and he sees the people in the setting sun that are very primitive uh, but it doesn't it just obscures the point that the scientific fact is the sun doesn't go down in a, in a muddy spring. Uh, one explanation I've heard is that Alexander, uh, he traveled west in Epirus in the northeast co uh, 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 coast of Greece, and before he hit the coastline, he, there, was a, there was a spring there. And, he, and, and Alexander was unintelligent enough to, to think that the sun went down in that spring. Well, this is the same Alexander that went all the way down to Egypt uh, would, would, uh, you know, and knew of Cyrenica and knew of the Mediterranean Sea, and that doesn't really seem very likely at all. Now, as you mentioned this, you just brought to mind, this is my edition of the Quran. It's the translation and commentary, A. Yusuf Ali. Mm -hmm. Now, he mentions the very thing you're talking about uh, on page 763 of this edition, and uh, in the middle paragraph, he states himself, personally, I have not the least doubt that Zul Karnayan is meant to be Alexander the Great, the historic Alexander, and not the legendary Alexander, of whom more presently. And he goes on and is talking about this, but it's right here in this mm -hmm. uh, Islamic translation of the Holy Quran by Yusuf Ali on page 763. So a little verification to go along with what you're saying about Alexander the Great. Yeah, I, I, I should also say, add that I have a translation by Yusuf Ali, and apparently it's a different year or something uh, because the page number is different. Oh, okay. Uh, so uh, the, uh, the, 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 the page number we're talking about is actually 845. And, and your edition, I've got a 1977 edition, so your okay. edition must be a different. Probably, uh, I'm not sure what it is. It's pro pro probably a little bit later, but uh, but 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 uh, uh, what, whatever page um, he did mention, though, an alternate su suggestion of an ancient Persian king or a, a Himyarite king, uh, which would be, be be from Yemen. But the point is, who this ruler is, it doesn't matter. The, the, uh, you know, either the sun goes down and set in, in a muddy spring, or it doesn't. Mm -hmm. And I kind of think it, it doesn't. And this says it, it was a fact that he found out that it did go down in a muddy spring. Okay. <laughs> Uh, another uh, thing is that uh, they said that the Jews, and there's no qualification here, it said Jews called Ezra or Uzair, uh, the son of God. Now Yusuf Ali happens, uh, first of all the translation says Uzair, uh, but in the footnote they admit that this is Ezra. And Yusuf Ali says, well, um, a, a, a guy named Baidawi uh, says that there was a sect of Jews that believed that Ezra was the son of God. Okay. Um, there is no sect of Jews in all of my studies that ever believed. It is just as, as 
as accurate to say that there's a sect of Muslims believing that Ezra is a son of God, Ezra is there's a sect of Jews. And let me reiterate, there's zero evidence that any sects of Muslims believe that Ezra is a son of God. And there's zero evidence that any Jews believe that Ezra is a son of God. They're just making this up and they don't have any backing it, backing it all. All right, then we've got, uh, now this is interesting, Muhammad and the Irish Americans. All right, just imagine for a second, and uh, just imagine that somebody read something in the Quran, there was something in the Quran that said that an Irish American talked to Muhammad. You would say, <laughs> boy, that would be ridiculous. That would be laughable because there were no Irish Americans in the time of Muhammad. Okay, well, Hypothetically, how would you answer that? Well, a Muslim could answer that by saying, well, maybe it was not Irish Americans, but maybe it's somebody whose name was, he was named Irish American. Mm -hmm. Or maybe it was some other group of people. You know, so they could, so if, if that was in there, they could sort of answer it that way. All right. But even though there is nothing in the Quran saying that an Irish American talked to Muhammad, there are some other things that are equally interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, in Surah 20, 85 to 87, also verses 95 to 97, it says that a Samaritan was the one who molded the golden calf in Moses' time. And the word here is, is Samari, okay? And the problem is, it is there weren't any Samaritans until the, the separation of the divided kingdom, which happened after 1000 BC. And uh, Moses' time was, you know, 1430. Uh, 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 you know, they left Egypt about, uh, you know, uh, 1430, 1405 uh, BC. And so, I'm sorry, they went into the Promised Land about 1405 uh, and, and 1445 BC. But uh, so there were no Samaritans in this time. So Muslims, they try to answer this and notice the pattern they say well Samari uh, some Muslims will say yes it means Samaritan other Muslims will say well that was a personal name okay so they try to get around it that way okay and there's actually the Dictionary of Islam says that the Muslim scholar al Baidawi says that the man's name was Musa bin Zafar and he was of the tribe of the Samaritan so this is al Baidawi is saying that this really was Samaritans here okay so it's you know, you know, either it's really a Samaritan or it's some guy named Samari, but we have no Jewish name or Egyptian name of Samari that we know of. You know, it's sort of like if it's an Irish Americans, they'd either have to say it really is Irish Americans or they have to say some man named Irish American. <laughs> All right, let's look at the next one. In Surah 1251, when in the context is talking about various stories in the Old Testament, but when it mentions uh, uh, who the person that we know as, as Potiphar, it uses the name Aziz. Okay, now sometimes between, you know, maybe Hebrew and Arabic or Hebrew and Greek or the languages, they kind of transliterate the name to where, you know, it's, it's a tiny bit different. You know, uh, Isa and Jesus, you know, are the same and, and you can see how, how one kind of comes to the other because they don't, you know, use the J sound. And, but Aziz is an Arabic name, it is no relation at all to Potiphar. It doesn't sound like it at all in, in, in Hebrew and Arab, in, in Egyptian or anything else. And so just this name was what, what was, was stuck in. You know, it, it's sort of like if we read the Bible and we and someone gave you a special translation and it said that Joseph's master was named Frank. You know, it's like, well, Frank doesn't sound like Potiphar. <laughs> you know, well, it's a, Aziz. It sounds just as foreign to Egyptian ears. All right. Mm -hmm. Well, they could say, well, maybe it was lost in translation or maybe it was a different name or maybe they all spoke Arabic back then, what, 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 whatever. <laughs> but it's pretty hard to get around that one. Okay. Another one that says, it's kind of a historical anachronism, is it said that the Pharaohs threatened to crucify people. And this was in Surah uh, chapter 7, Surah 7, uh, verse 124, uh, 2141, and also uh, Surah 2649. Now, crucifixion was not known in Egypt in the time of Moses. Crucifixion was done by the Carthaginians and by the Persians and the Romans who learned it from them and may have done, been done by the Greeks later, but way back in Moses' time, uh, they didn't have crucifixion at all, okay? Uh, another one is, it talks about Mary is the mother of Jesus. Uh, okay, so we know that Mary. And it talks about Mary as a sister of Aaron in Surah 1928. Okay, well, there what Mary and Miriam are the same in, in, in Hebrew. Uh, and there were two Marys, but uh, apparently Muhammad uh, got them mixed up because um, she, the sister of Aaron lived, you know, roughly, you know, four, 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 uh, 1400 years before, uh, you know, Jesus' mother. So how would that happen? Well, they would say, well, the Muslim explanation is she must have been a sister of Aaron because she must have been from the tribe of Aaron. All right. 
Well, a couple of problems with that. In the genealogy in Luke, it indicates you know she was from the tribe of Judah, at least on her father's side. Uh, we don't know her mother's side. You know could have been Aaron on the other side, but it wouldn't have said sister of Aaron, it wouldn't have said daughter of Aaron mm -hmm. if, if it had been from the tribe. I mean, people have been called sons of Abraham or sons of daughters of whoever, and in both Hebrew and Arabic culture, uh, Hebrew they have the word ben, which means like son of, so ben whatever, and Arabic, very similar, they have ben, uh, you know, for, uh, for son of, or, or I believe bent, I believe it, it uh, you know, can mean daughter of, and these, you know, you talk about descendants, you don't say sister of Aaron. Right, it sounds again like the Muslims are trying to explain it away by th jumping through hoops that are too small for them and they end right. up rolling on the ground and they just basically want you to accept their explanation whether there's any real logic to it at all. Yeah. Anyway, you got another one here. Yeah, uh, Haman, uh, and, I, and I'm not really sure how they can even attempt to do this one. All right, Haman, who was the, 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 the evil minister uh, in the time of Esther in the Persian Empire, he did not live at the same time as Pharaoh and Moses, despite what Surus 2939, 40, 23 through 24, and verses 20, 36 to 37 say. Okay, so this has Haman talking to you know Moses and Pharaoh basically together and he must have been a long-lived man uh, <laughs> uh, to, you, you know to, to, to be alive for uh, you know almost a thousand years uh, but anyway I, well let me let me uh, ask you this now in defense of Muhammad you know for the sake of our Muslim viewers now we just established the fact a while ago that Muhammad himself didn't write down the Quran mm -hmm. what about the possibility that when they're collecting all these sayings from these different people of Muhammad and putting them together in, a, in, in the Quran as we know it today, maybe someone, you know, made a mistake in remembering what, uh, maybe they thought of Aziz instead of, uh, you know, Potiphar, or, or maybe, you know, maybe it's possible that some of the people that were, they were counting on to remember something that Muhammad said made a mistake, and that's why there's these problems. Uh, what would they say to that? Or, well, I, um... I, I, I'm, I'm not sure at, at how, how they would respond to that, but... That I mean, is, that would be a possibility. Yeah, it, Isn't it, it possible that someone could, by just a mistake, no, no part of their own, maybe they, they, they had Alzheimer's disease or something, and they just misthought of something, but then the problem would be, well, if that's, that's true, then Muhammad didn't make a mistake, but these guys made the mistake but, later, but, but then you got a problem, and then you can't trust the Quran. Okay, yeah. That's one possibility that the Quran wasn't preserved, right? But another possibility is is it was remembered correctly, and Muhammad himself got them mixed up. So you can't win either way, right? If if in other words, someone might have made a, someone made a mistake on one end or the other. There's definitely a mistake somewhere. Now. Uh, I think God, all, God, who's all knowing, you know, He knew that that Mary was different. He knew that that Haman didn't live in the same time as, as, as Pharaoh and Moses. So, if God didn't make the mistake, did Muhammad make the mistake? Did someone come after the mistake, or was what Muhammad, was were those particular surahs, or was all of it, you know, not from Allah? And or else we're faced with uh, listening to these these almost ridiculous explanations that. Uh, that the Muslim apologists would come up with to try to explain these verses away. Right. So but, 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 but for all these, and I'm not excluding the last one, I'll just say that Muslims do have explanations for these, uh, but they, explanations to me, uh, explain it just about as well as if a Muslim had to explain Irish American stuff. Right, right. Now let's go to uh, Muslim morals. Okay. Uh, a lot of times in America, people talk about the Judeo Christian heritage or Judeo Christian mm -hmm. morals because you, they, you know, a lot of similarities, you know, but, uh, between, you know, the New Testament, what it says, and what the Old Testament on moral parts. Though, of course, the, the, the Christians, uh, Christ superseded the dietary and the, and the temple parts. And, and Muslim morals are considered, you know, many people think of them as similar, and perhaps they might be more similar than maybe witchcraft, and, you know, compared to witchcraft or Hinduism or something like that, Muslim morals are more similar to, to, to Christian and Jewish morals. Um, for example, uh, Muslims, they believe you're not to have idols, you're not to sell idols, you're not to have fortune-telling items. Um, that's good, th good stuff. Um, the Hadiths teach they will go to hell if they commit suicide, which maybe some Muslim fanatics today have forgotten about. Uh, there was basically a Muslim warrior uh, who was in great pain and so he committed suicide and Muhammad said that he was going to hell because he committed suicide. This is not in the Quran, by the way, this is in the Hadith. Um, and 
However, the, the, the morals take a sharp turn, <laughs> divergence here, where it says, you know, when they, uh, with captured women, it, having sex with them is okay, even if the women are not willing, okay? Uh, robbery uh, against uh, people who are non-believers or, or the house of war is okay. Uh, a, a Muslim can never be killed for killing a, an infidel, you know, no matter what the circumstances. Revenge is okay. Hatred, cursing. Muhammad orders someone to be assassinated. Uh, they killed entire villages. So those morals don't say that Muslim morals are the same as Christian morals. It's kind of demeaning, I think, to Christian morals a little bit. Uh, also, the Muslim emphasis is a little bit different. Uh, they believe in prayer, as do Christians and Jews, uh, but they believe that it's very important to pray at the proper times and, and do it the right way, while Christians say, no, it's really the content that's important. And I'm talking, by the way, about mainline Muslims here, you know, Sunnis and, and some Shiites. Uh, Sufis, uh, probably a little bit different category here. Um, okay, and they believe that fasting and ritual washing are very significant, and uh, they have a different view of, of divorce uh, than is in the Bible. Uh, and I'll have to say, unfortunately, many Americans don't follow what the Bible says about divorce either. But, you know, Muhammad married his own daughter-in-law. There was another case to where a man was really good friends with another man, and so he basically said, well, you know, I'll take one of my wives and I'll divorce her so that you can marry her. Well, that's a nice thing, but it doesn't seem to show that that marriage bond was really very, um, you know, very... Well, it, it's just alien to the biblical record right. of what marriage is and, and requirements for divorce and things like that. Mm. So that's why those Muslim morals there would disagree sharply with, right. the, with the biblical uh, uh, version. Okay, now, uh, this is next chart is likewise fascinating. Take us into it about beating your disobedient wife. I'm sure there's a lot of husbands out there that want to know, you know, uh, if they can uh, beat their wife. All right. Well, <laughs> uh, first of all, in, 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 the, in the Bible, the Bible never says that husbands are to beat their wives or wives are to beat their husbands. Or, or, and, and it does say that uh, with your children, you can discipline them, but don't provoke them. To, you know, to uh, wrath. It, right. So, but anyway, in the Quran, it says that if your wife is disobedient, uh, you know, you warn her, you banish her to her couch, you know, I mean, you don't sleep with her, and then you say to, uh, to beat, or another translation is scourge your wife uh, if she is disobedient. All right. Now, uh, I've heard Muslims say that that means like uh, tap lightly as a reminder, something like that. A couple problems with that. All right. First of all, in language, the Arabic word beat or scourge is the same word to beat a, to beat a violent criminal or to beat a camel. Okay. Also, the Quran. What if the what if the wife was good, but the husband was doing bad things, you know, um, getting drunk or something like that? It never says that anybody's supposed to beat the, the the wife's beat the husband, or she's supposed to get her relatives to beat the husband, or anything like that. You know, it's only kind of a one-way street here. Okay. Uh, another thing. This was kind of an aside on the on the uh, next chart, but uh, it'll relate to this in a second. Is how did they beat slaves? Well, in the Bukhari Hadith, Volume 3, before number 734, it says, If someone beats a slave, he should spare his face. <laughs> All right, so that sounds like a pretty severe beating, so it leave permanent marks if you were to do that in the face. Okay? Mm -hmm. And then if you go on to Bukhari, uh, Volume 8, verse uh, number 68, uh, it, uh, Muhammad is basically saying, um, How does any of you beat his wife as he beats a stallion camel? And then he may embrace, meaning sleep, sleep with her. And Hisham said, as he beats his slave. So, as I understand this, Muhammad is actually kind of maybe uh, telling other Muslims, and said, how can you beat a wife as hard as you beat, you know, your male camel, and then you want to sleep with her right after that, that you can't be that harsh and that tender and don't be so harsh. Mm -hmm. And then Hisham maybe just listened to the first part, and when he said, how do you beat your wife? And he says, well, I beat my wife as I beat my slave. And there's nothing after that that says, oh, well, Hisham was wrong. I mean, maybe a tiny bit too severe, but, um, you know, that, that's how they can get beaten. Mm -hmm. Because, as you just saw on the chart before, the, it says if anyone uh, beats a slave, he should spare his face. Right. Uh, so, here in this other chart, if he's going to beat a slave, he's going to beat him, but spare her face, or if it's, in this case, his wife. Mm. So, uh, obviously, the beating here, uh, I think, couldn't possibly be taken in context as lightly tapping. Right. There, and to listen to Muslims argue that that's what it means, 
once again, is stretching credulity mm -hmm. and taken in context with what all the Hadiths and uh, Quranic literature have to say to us. Right, right, right. And, and to the Muslim, I'd sort of say, I'm not so interested in really what, what you're saying it means in the 20th century. What did it mean to the people who heard it? What did it mean to the Muslims at that time? And we can see that from the Hadiths, and it wasn't lightly. Right. And I think uh, possibly uh, what we get here from uh, Muslims making these statements on the different things we've already brought up is that they were trying to turn away, hide from the obvious impact, mm -hmm. especially in this particular culture we find ourselves in. This is a very unpopular to uh, have something like wife beating, you know, and it's politically correct culture that we live here in America. Yeah, and, and, as it should be unpopular. <laughs> uh, obviously, they're going to they're gonna say things like that to try to escape the obvious import. When uh, I was at the University of Texas uh, doing some evangelism with uh, my Christian buddies out there, and we had several Muslims uh, gather around out there, and in other cases, we had Jewish students who were uh, debating with us and mm -hmm. arguing against our Christian position, attacking the Bible and so forth. What was interesting is in, in both cases, when I was out there two different times, one mainly dealing with the Muslims and another dealing with the Jewish students, uh, in both cases I was able to bring up points, as we've just brought up here from the Hadiths in the Muslim case, and in the other case I was bringing up Talmudic writings, mm -hmm. uh, dealing with how Jewish men are to deal with their, their, their women, their wives, and so forth. Uh, let me tell you, people out there at the UT campus, and I'm dealing with a lot of intelligent people, mm -hmm. be a student at the UT or a teaching assistant or a professor, they weren't missing the import of what I was quoting out of these religious books, either the Talmud or the Hadith, and they could understand clearly what it was saying. Mm -hmm. And nobody out there was buying this lightly tapping or something. Mm -hmm. And this is what we get, though, when we're dealing with Muslims uh, that are trying to escape the import of this. They're, right. they're, they're coming up with these arguments that are really incredulous. They're, <laughs> they're, 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 like I've said many times, they're jumping through hoops that are too small. They don't succeed in getting through the hoop, and they consequently fall on the ground. They're rolling around. They look sort of like a clown at the circus because the arguments just don't jive with the context and the logic of what Muhammad and the Hadiths are trying to tell us. Mm -hmm. And so I want to make that point clear to our viewers right now, that when Steve brings up these points, you see it clearly taught in the Hadith. Can we just sh sh shovel it away with some excuse? No, we have to analyze it, much like we analyze when the Muslims attack the Bible and argue, well, the Bible says this, and there's problems with the Bible and this and that. You know, can we argue and make defense of the Bible in a logical, consistent way that jives with history and the facts, or do we have to make up funny little stories that really, in the long run, don't make sense? See, this is the things we have to, to analyze and discuss when we're, we're going over these things. Now, I've just brought up uh, the Bible here and how the Bible is a favorite target of uh, Muslims and other religions. They like to attack the Bible because basically they need to attack the Bible because the Bible doesn't say the same things that their religion says. Right, right, right. So, if the Bible today were accurate, Islam would fall. Right, so and, and the Muslims know that as well. Mm -hmm. The Bible has to go because if the Bible stands, then Islam has to go. <laughs> I mean, it's, just, it's as simple as that. Now, uh, you've got a chart here that our viewers now look at. We're tying this in. Uh, differences in tone and message. And it clearly says, Jesus said, but I tell you, hear me, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. And that's coming from Luke 6, 27 through 29, the New International Version. Do you practice the words of Jesus, the Prince of Peace? Now, uh, for our viewers, could you elaborate a little bit? In, in, a, in a broad highlight type of way, we, we've talked about being your wise, Muslim morals about cursing and assassination okay. and things, and, and kind of tie this into the biblical morals that the Lord Jesus taught us. And as we established from uh, our show number one in this Islam series, Jesus was sinless, Muhammad was not. Right. And this is based on Islamic sources. Mm. The Islamic sources are saying Jesus is sinless. So we've got a sinless man here teaching us things right. and the way we should behave. Go ahead and elaborate okay. on this. Well, besides looking at details, I guess, in the Bible and in the Quran, you can look at the overall kind of message. And the overall message, I think, is, you know, 
uh, is that Jesus is saying, you know, the first two commandments are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, might, soul, and strength, and love your neighbors yourself. And that he came as the Lamb of God, sacrificed for the sins of the world. And he taught about love, not taking revenge, um, and, 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 and even loving your enemies. Okay, and this message pervades Christianity, it pervades the Bible, um, doesn't pervade most of Islam. So, you, know, you know, you don't hear anything about this. Uh, you hear all about revenge and, 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 and hatred, at least on, on, a, on a broad scale, you know, with what I see, you know, interviewing people re in, in Muslim countries, reading the newspapers, things like that, looking at what's going on in Indonesia, you know, it's just hatred and killing. Now, uh, a lot of this relates into what's called, and we'll probably cover this in more detail in some shows coming up, but uh, the, the, the Islamic uh, theological term of jihad, Mm -hmm. which I guess means holy war. Right. Uh, and a lot of that holy war stuff ties into this hatred for whatever they've got a hatred against. You, 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 you're, you're supposed to do that. Now, now I should say there are some small sects of Islam that give a, a twist on that too. You know, like the Ahmadiyya Muslims, for example, they say that you should have a jihad of the pen and not of the sword. So they say mm -hmm. only writing. But they're not really true to what Muhammad said uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and what Muhammad practiced. Okay, so, so it, 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 it really is a, a, a religion of war, not a religion of the Prince of Peace. Okay, so Jesus, uh, you know, after uh, when they were coming and taking that night to crucify him, mm -hmm. and Peter cut off uh, Malchus's ear. Slave of the high priest, yeah. The, the servant of the high priest. Uh, Jesus told him to put his sword away. Those who, uh, you know, live by the sword shall die by the sword. Mm -hmm. And he healed the servant's ear. Uh, and as we go into uh, the scripture, you know, our, our, our weapons of our warfare are, are spiritual and not right. fleshly. Right. Je Jesus never, never told us to kill anybody. And, 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 and if we have disagreements with Muslims, Hindus, atheists, uh, we want to talk about them peacefully. But, but anybody who says you should kill somebody because, you know, you know today, you know, because of a different religion, isn't practicing what Jesus taught. Right. So right, right there again, we have a, a, a big contrast to what Jesus is saying and what Muhammad and the, the uh, Quran and the Hadith are saying. Uh, and this again brings me into an interesting point, and we've only got a couple of minutes left. Uh, to me, and I'll say this probably many times during this series, but I want to I want to put this point to the viewer. To me, Islam, when you compare it to the teachings of the Bible and the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ, is a religion of disbelief in Jesus and what he said. Now I know the Muslims say, well, we believe in Jesus. Blessings and peace be upon him. And, and they all just don't this stuff. Listen to what he says. <laughs> right. See, they they believe what. They believe in the Jesus that Muhammad and the Hadith portray, mm -hmm. but they don't listen to the Jesus of the biblical record and to what his apostles and, and contemporaries said in the scripture themselves. So basically, to be a good Muslim, you have to disregard, disbelieve what the Lord Jesus Christ clearly taught. And in, in fact, kind of sweep what Jesus said under the rug and give priority to Muhammad, right. who was a sinner, according to the Islamic teachings, and forget most of what Jesus said, who was sinless, even according to what the Quran and Hadith would say, <laughs> that he had no sin and Satan couldn't even touch him. Right. Uh, so with that said, uh, we've got a, one other chart here. We've got about a minute to go. Uh, I'll just read it here. It's 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 7. And then as soon as I read it, Steve, just make any uh, final comments as okay. we go off the air. I'll, I'll, right after you make those, I'll, I'll, I'll mention our newsletters that people can get a hold of, their phone numbers they can call. But it, it says in 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 7, If I speak in the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains and have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the plains, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it, does, it is not proud, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking, 
It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Okay. That is a key part of the message of love in the Bible. And the viewer, uh, especially the Muslim viewer, needs to, needs to listen, uh, listen to the words in the Bible and say, okay, are these different? Are these the same uh, basic tone as what's in the Quran? And if you look at the errors in the Quran the, the, that we've seen here and you, and you contrast it with the teaching of the Quran, teaching of the Bible, you have a decision to make. If the Bible is reliably preserved, which we will get into in the next one to show that it is, um, then you have to decide. Are you going to believe a book that says the Bible is true and contradicts it, or are you going to believe the Bible? Amen. And uh, for our viewers, uh, we have our Christian Answers newsletters that are available free of charge. If you contact the numbers or write the address that are in the screen, we also have a resource list we'll send you free and other materials on Islam if you'd like that as well. So. Uh, uh, Keep in mind what we've uh, stated here. Tune in next time as we continue this series. Thank you for being with us. This is Larry Wessels, Director of Christian Answers, with Steve Morrison. Thanks again, Steve, for being with us, Director of Research for Christian Answers. Be with us again. And remember what Jesus said, the one who is sinless, according to what the Islamic teachings say. He said, I, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. Who? Jesus Christ. He didn't say Muhammad, he said himself. That's John 14, 6. All right, God bless you all. Thank you for being with us. Jesus said in the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verses 7 through 10, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. Likewise, Jesus said of those that come after him in Matthew chapter 24, verse 24 and 25, for false Christs and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders, so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. Behold, I have told you in advance. What is Jesus' gospel which he entrusted to his apostles? The answer can be found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 8, which states, now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which you also received, in which also you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I deliver to you as of first importance that I also receive, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. And last of all, as it were to one untimely born, he, he appeared to me also. All of this is attested to by Jesus' own disciples, eyewitnesses, and apostles, along with manuscript and early church history. The small book of Jude in the Bible says in verse 3, Beloved, while I was making every effort to write you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. Now, something is important here, and that is this faith was once for all delivered to the saints.
check out our websites, biblequery.org. This site answers 7,700 Bible questions. Historycart.com. This site reveals early church history and doctrine proving Roman Catholicism is not historically or doctrinally viable. MuslimHope.com. This site is a classic refutation of Islam, a counterfeit religion created by Muhammad. Free newsletters are also available. 